Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast, now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast worldwide. My name is Scott Miller and I am continued to be honored and privileged to serve as your host and interviewer each week. As you may know, I recently published a book about the podcast called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds on Sale Now, where I culminated from our first season 30 of what I thought were some of the most transformational interviews. Fairly episodic in nature, but I think can help to add a transformative insight for each of you trying to grow your leadership skills formally or informally. Pick up a copy of Master Mentors, the first in a 10-volume series every year coming out from HarperCollins. Now, today's guest I met as a guest on his podcast some time ago. And I don't know about you, but occasionally in our lives, we have the serendipitous privilege of meeting someone that isn't just smart, but is also wise, because we know those things are not mutually exclusive. And today, our guest, Gay Hendricks, a world-famous, renowned, best-selling author, consultant, coach, advisor, truly represents that sort of nexus between being smart and being wise. Gay, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you so much, Scott. What a great introduction. I really appreciate being here with you, and I loved having you on our podcast. So this is uh, great to get to spend some time with you again. Gay, the pleasure is truly ours. You just landed back in Los Angeles from some keynote speeches in New York City, where all of us are now kind of just dipping back into the live, in-person keynote speech. It's both a little bit um, intimidating and also a little bit exhilarating, is it not, to get back in the stage. You certainly have given thousands of keynotes around the world from the many books that you've authored. Today, we're going to talk about your most recent book called The Genius Zone. But what I'd like to do, Gay, is invite you for a couple of minutes. Could you take some time and reintroduce yourself to the millions of people that are both watching and listening who no doubt have come across some of your books across your career. Talk about your own journey. What is your expertise and how perhaps you now came to have written the new book, The Genius Zone? Yes. First of all, I want to appreciate my wife, Katie, because she and I just uh, went to New York together because I was there giving a talk and seeing a client but it also happens to be our 40th wedding anniversary. And so we went to New York to see some theater and museums and things like that as a way to celebrate our, our 40th wedding anniversary. And so, uh, yes, uh, I'm a psychologist by training. Um, I am about to publish my 50th book in 50 years. So I've written about a book a year for the past 50 years. I uh, mostly write books about relationships and business and transformation. But I also, in my spare time, I write mystery novels. And I've written about half a dozen mystery novels that are now out there. And I have two or three more that I'm working on right now. So it's kind of the, uh, one of my hobbies uh, where I go to for relaxation and uh, enjoying myself. I sit down and write a mystery novel now and then. So uh, we live in California. Uh, my wife is a native Californian. And uh, I met her out here way back a long time ago. And the smartest thing I ever did was uh, persuade Katie to marry me. And we've had a fabulous trip. We, we've we worked together the whole time that we've been together because Katie's also a psychologist. And so uh, like when we uh, wrote our book that got us on April, April, uh, Oprah uh, 30 years ago, uh, it was called Conscious Loving. And it was a relationship book written by two people uh, who were in a relationship. And so... When our publicist booked us on Oprah, they said, well, we only want to take one of you uh, because we don't want to spend for an extra airplane ticket. (laughs) And so I said, I kind of threw a conscious temper tantrum and I said, wait a minute, it's a relationship book and we're actually going to come on the show as a couple. And no, we won't come on as a single uh, person. And so uh, we ended up uh, winning the argument and we... um, we're on there as a couple starting on that show back around 1990 and then on other shows in the uh, decade to come. Uh, but relationship is very important. And I think that our relationship with our genius is one of the central, most important things that we have access to as human beings. Because if you think about it, who are you in relationship with first? Well. You're in relationship with who you are inside, how your mind works, how your body works, how your emotions work, and 
how how much can you speak honestly about what's going on inside you and how much can you take responsibility for your life rather than blaming others and how much can you live in the sweet spot of a spiritual connection however you define that whether that's through religion or meditation or whatever you come to but we have a spiritual center inside ourselves and if if you're not in, engaged in a formal religion then what are you going to do well a lot of people meditate and a lot of people do other kind of spiritual practices but the key thing is that all of us come wired from the factory as spiritual human beings having a human experience rather than human beings having an occasional spiritual experience and so we all got here through that spiritual impulse and one of the things that we need to do in life is develop that so that we're living out of our unique individual genius each of us has our own personal purpose in life as well as being having you know purposes that other people want for us like our parents want us to be good citizens and they want us to be loving and they want us to have a good job and make a contribution and so other people have their intentions for us but down inside we need to have our own special relationship with ourselves starting with that part of ourselves that I believe is pure genius that has that you see, I don't think genius is as wild and crazy as a lot of people think it is. I'm very much interested in a practical approach to genius, where people find out what their unique abilities are and then express those in their family and their friendships and in their work life so that everybody gets to, partic to participate in everybody else's genius. Gay, your wisdom is already palpable, but I'm slightly concerned that your great grandkids are all going to be driving Maseratis from the royalties from 50 books. What are you doing to prevent that from happening? You've got a great legacy, well, sir. That's a very timely question because my wife and I, for the last couple of years, have been working on that because I don't necessarily think it's a good thing to dump a whole bunch of money on kids when they're 18 or 21. I've seen some terrible results yes. from yes. that, frankly. And uh, I've been you know, practicing as a therapist in addition to my other activities for the past 50 years. And so I've had a chance to see thousands of people go all sorts of different directions with, uh, with having money put on them. So anyway, uh, to make a long story short, my wife and I have a, a nonprofit foundation called the Foundation for Conscious Living. And we've uh, seeded that with a couple of million dollars of our own and then other people make donations to that too and that's kind of one of our pride and joy in addition to our training institute is the fact that uh, our our foundation gives out a lot of grants and scholarships and um, funds various projects and research and that kind of thing so we're very uh, proud of that so that's probably the main thing i'm going to do with my money at the end the kids get a little bit you know um, they uh, They'll have a little chunk, but not enough to mess up their lives too much. That's the way I thought about it. So I was not predicting your imminent demise for all the listeners wondering. <laughs> I'm sure we have many more dozens of books to come out in the coming years. Let's talk today about The Genius Zone, which is your most recent release. The tagline, Gay, is the breakthrough process to end negative thinking and live in true creativity. So before we get to this whole process you have around these four zones and how we move perhaps even from our zone of excellence to our zone of creativity, we'll get there in a few moments. Let's talk about something we all struggle with. The most positive, the most dynamic, the most creative, the most forward thinking. All of us, of course, struggle with negative thinking, even the most successful of us in the world. As a psychiatrist, will you talk a bit about how all of us struggle with negative thinking, how it manifests, maybe some tips on how to minimize or eliminate that so we're ready to pivot into our zone of creativity. Yes. Well, first of all, negative thinking is one of the biggest plagues that limits human beings' happiness and success. And if you think about it, there are basically two things that go on in our minds. There's the positive things where we're thinking of what I'm going to do today to prosper myself and my family and my community. So that's a very positive thing to think about. 
Another one is, what am I going to do today to take care of my health, to make sure I feel better in my body and so I can make a bigger contribution to life? How am I going to nurture my spirit today? How am I going to do that through prayer or meditation or however you contact the spiritual essence of ourselves and the universe itself? I happen to think that's a huge part of life because in a way, if we're not right and aligned with that part of ourselves that knows the great gift of life, that knows what a great gift it is to be imbued with human intelligence and a spiritual essence to ourselves, unless we can go around in a state of appreciation for that and celebrating that, we're not going to be happy. And so I think that we have these two minds. One is the negative thinking mind and one is the positive thinking mind. And, you know, it's like that old Native American story where the, the little boy says, uh, Grandfather, I've got these two minds inside me. It's like one of them is, is like uh, a really loving, positive creature. And another one is kind of like uh, a barking dog. And it's an irritation. It's a negative part of me. And the grandfather said, well, just ask yourself one question. Which one do you feed more? And if you really think about it, how much time we spend going around thinking about what we don't have or what somebody else has that we'd like, or we're upset because we're not where we think we ought to be. We bounce around in this zone that's between where we are at the moment and where we think we ought to be. And so a lot of that thinking is negative thinking that's critical of ourselves or critical of other people. Now, the other side of our mind, that positive side of our mind, we'll just think how much of that do you spend time in every day? Almost it's like we feed that negative part of ourselves by giving it more attention. So I'm suggesting that when you notice yourself up there in that negative thinking space to immediately open up the space to salute that positive thinking part of you. Take a moment to think mm. instead of your crashes and burns. Take a moment to celebrate your achievements, what you've done in your life. Just balance that out by putting more attention in the things that really nurture yourself. I had the great gift of early medical problems in my life. I was born with something wrong with my glands so that I gained weight from a very early age. So by the end of my first year of life, I was in the top 2% of baby weights. I really looked like a gigantic ball of blubber. It was kind of cute on a one-year-old, but by the time I got to be a four-year-old, a five-year-old, I still uh, was obese. And so I was taken around to different uh, medical specialists and put on drugs and given shots and oh man I was through the whole thing and nothing ever I, I got it a little bit under control when I was in my teens uh, with some new drugs they came out of but as soon as I started take or stopped taking the drugs I would the weight would come back but I handled the problem with a spiritual experience when I was 24 years old I was 320 pounds. By the way, I weigh about 180 pounds right now, and I'm six feet tall, so I look like I look athletic. And uh, back then, though, I weighed 320 pounds, and I did not look athletic. I looked uh, like a pear. And so um, I had the great gift of an enlightenment experience when I was 24 by, v, uh, by means of a slip and fall on the ice in New England, where I was at the time. And I didn't knock myself out, but for about two minutes, I kind of slammed down on my back on this frozen road. And for about two minutes, I, I was, I call it now out of, I had an out of Hendrix experience because for about two minutes, I could see down through all the layers of myself that I'd never seen before, all my emotions and uh, how I was still grieving the loss of my father for 20 some years. And I hadn't known about all of that because I was living so much in my head. But this experience also showed me that I had this spiritual center that I had never really 
thought about or known about. And so that became the dominant force in my life. And so I lost more than 100 pounds over the, over the next year by simply eating foods that I felt fed my spirit. So fruits and vegetables rather than um, malted milkshakes and cheeseburgers and uh, those kinds of things. I pretty much had lived on junk food, but then I started eating things that fed my spirit. And within a year, I've lost more than 100 pounds. And so it really changed my life. And I think that, like I mentioned earlier, when human beings are in touch with that creative genius inside, that special spirit that we carry around, then our lives really prosper. And if we're not, no matter if we make $100 million, if we're missing that piece, then we don't feel good inside. To our guests and listeners, I promised you wisdom, and he is delivering. I, I'm anxious to get into this uh, idea about the four zones, but first, you said something that was actually profound. Before you told that story, you started with a very intentional phrase where I think you said something like, early in life, I was gifted with yes. the troubles, you know, your health troubles. That is clearly a mindset that you have created for yourself. Talk about how important it is to intentionally choose our mindsets in life and how perhaps your words need to mirror those because you're a perfect model of that right now on this podcast. Well, thank you. Uh, at the time, I don't think I saw it as a gift, but as the year proceeded, I realized I needed that kind of wake-up call because I hadn't been able to kind of get outside my old programming and just having a couple of minutes outside my old programming really changed my life because it opened up. It was like it shined a light on rooms that I hadn't known were filled with amazing things inside myself. And so as I began to shine more light on those things inside myself, I realized that what what sometimes seems like an accident or an illness or getting fired or losing a job or something can actually be the greatest gift. And so that's the way I like to approach things these days. When something happens that looks like it might be negative on the surface, I like to kind of step back from that and say, how could this be, how could this really serve me or serve the person? And so that's the way I look at it now. Also too, Scott, see, I think that we have the opportunity to go through life as thinking of ourselves as victims or creators. You know, if you go through your life thinking, okay, I'm creating, I'm not just being whipped around by fate by other people, I'm creating my experience by choosing what kind of life I like and what kind of people I want to be around and what kind of foods I want to eat. See, those kinds of things, in my opinion, are what really creates a life. But if you go into life like many people do, thinking of yourself as a victim and thinking of other people as the perpetrators of your feelings and that kind of thing, eh, that's a very painful way, in my opinion, to go through life because then you're always thinking of yourself at the effect of other people rather than saying, okay, I'm choosing this life. This is what I want. This is how I want to be. There's great power in conscious choice, especially when you have it linked up inside and aligned inside with your heart, your head, and your spirit. I always tell my students, here that uh, the longest journey they'll ever make is 12 inches long. It's from your head down to your heart. Because at some point, we all have to get into alignment between the way we think and the emotions we have, what's in our hearts, and also what will feed our spirit. Because I got here through an intense year of learning how to feed my spirit rather than feed my old persona. And so I recommend highly that all of us do everything we can to uncover that genius part of ourselves. Uh, you mentioned something I want to make sure we get in. That's the four zones, Scott. Um, when I first started looking at all of this way back 40 some years ago, I realized that every day I was spending time in one of four zones. I was either in my zone of incompetence where I was doing stuff I wasn't any good at, but I thought I had to do it because I couldn't afford somebody else to do it for me or something. 
like I'm hopeless with machinery. I'm not good with machinery. I don't like to operate it. My wife's a genius. She grew up in a family of engineers. She can fix anything. But if she sees me with a screwdriver in my hand as quickly as possible, she gets it out of my hand before I hurt somebody. Uh, my second zone that I discovered was the zone of competence, where I was doing stuff that I was good at, but somebody else could do it just as well. The third zone is great to start with, but it has a little trap built in it. The third zone is your zone of excellence, where you're doing stuff that you're good at, you make money at it, other people appreciate you for it, lots of attaboys and attagirls. Um, but if you do it too long, it'll burn you out because you need to spend time in your genius zone. The fourth zone, the genius zone, is when you're doing what you most love to do and you're doing something that makes the biggest possible contribution to other people. So to me, that's the sweet spot of genius. When I'm doing what I love to do, like right now, I could do this all day long. Some days I do it all day long. And I, I never turn down an opportunity, whether I'm talking to the person in the next airplane seat or talking to 10 million people on an Oprah show or something of that nature. To me, it's all the same because I feel incredibly privileged that I got to learn some things in life that not only changed my life, but have now changed the lives of millions of people. And my life is dedicated to giving that away. And I wanna do everything I can to express every ounce of wisdom I have within me uh, before I check out. And so hopefully when they uh, lower my head uh, down on my deathbed, I'll still be uh, saying, hey, don't forget to uh, add that last chapter to my book here. And so, uh, when you're in your genius zone, time becomes something that is sacred. Because when you're in that genius zone, you're not only nurturing your own spirit, you're potentially feeding the spirits of other people through the books you write or the soups you make or the whatever it is you do. You know, my mentor Abraham Maslow said there's no difference between a genius soup and a genius symphony. They both call on the same aspect of yourself. I say genius is anything that has the capacity to surprise you. And something that you bring forth every day that can surprise you. That's to me living in the sweet spot of your genius. So let's take a deeper dive on that thought. These four zones, I'm going to assume by the very nature of the millions of people who are listening or watching to this podcast, they're interested in improving their performance, their leadership. They've had some success, certainly in life, for many of them, remarkable success. And I'm gonna guess a lot of us, me included, are quite comfortable in our zone of excellence. Like you said, it's very validating, it's very comfortable, all the attaboys. And we didn't know perhaps there was something else, that there was a zone of genius. Gay, get practical, get like super practical. Speak to all of us that are in our zone of excellence, We've now uncovered that there is a next zone of genius. How do we get there? One of the conversations that got me started thinking about all this way back was I had a successful attorney in my office. And he said the following thing to me. He said, I'm 40 years old. I've been an attorney now for the last 15 years. I've been incredibly successful. I'm in all the right clubs. I have a big 401k. Uh, my wife loves the clubs we're in. And, you know, my kids like flying first class and that kind of thing. And then he said to me, here was the punchline. He said, and if I feel like, I feel like if I keep this up, I'm going to kill myself. So one of the things that happens oftentimes with successful people is that they are busy doing what has made them successful and they keep doing it and keep doing it until the universe says, hey, you've got to change things up a little bit. So often there's an illness or an accident or a marital split up or family discord is disruption, something that knocks things off kilter. Sometimes people actually have to bottom out through addiction or getting really sick or something like that. What I want to recommend is 
you don't have to be sick in order to get better. So don't think you have to hurt yourself when you get to midlife in order to learn the following lesson. And the following lesson, which often happens at midlife, is you've been in your zone of excellence too long. You need to make sure you get acquainted with that part of you that's pure genius, that part of you that doesn't have any effort attached to it. To me, one of the signs of genius is you can do it all day long and you never get tired of doing it. And in fact, I tell my uh, students that come here to the Institute to work with us that unless you end the day feeling better physically than when you started, you're not living in your genius enough. You're not working in your genius enough. Here's my promise to you. The more you open up and do more every day of what you most love to do about your work, whatever it is, you know, it could be the people part, it could be the data part, it could be organizing the things part, but whatever it is, it calls on what you love to do. Like I just got back from New York uh, yesterday and my organizational genius, Alessandra, had been here while I was out of town this past week and got my office reorganized and got everything put into place. She can spend days do that, doing that, and she's well paid for it. But you know what? If I tried to do that, I'd last about 10 minutes and start screaming probably because I make messes. I don't clean them up. And so I'd much rather have a person I can pay 30 bucks an hour or two to come in and do my organizing for me than go through the process of saying, oh no, where do I put this? Where do I put that? So I've eliminated everything that's not in my genius zone. And so for the past, tw oh, by the way, I didn't start out this way. When I first started, I was spending about 10% of my time in my genius zone every day. And then I started expanding that. By the end of the last century, I was up to 90 to 100% of my time. I had eliminated things that I don't want to do. I'd eliminated things that I'm excellent at, but not a genius at. And so my time now every day is spent pretty much only doing the things that I most love to do or hauling my body around from place to place. Like I was on an airplane yesterday and I'm not necessarily a genius flyer, but I did some work and then I kicked back and watched a movie and grabbed a nap and that kind of thing. So, uh, but, but that's what you have to do to express your genius is you got to get around in the material world. So I love what I do. And I particularly love that I get to do all day long things that I most love to do. It took me a lot of work to get there. And one of the things it's going to take you is a whole bunch of yeses and a whole bunch of no's. In other words, getting into your genius zone involves saying yes to more of what you're good at, what you really love to do. It, it's saying yes to what creates the biggest amount of productivity for you per time spent. So there's a lot of yes. But I'll tell you, to get in, stay in your genius zone, you've got to get good at saying no, too. You've got to get good at saying no to things that are not in your genius zone. Because the power of no is equal to the power of yes when it's applied in the right place. And the place I suggest you start applying it is saying a conscious, enlightened no to things that are not in your zone of genius and saying yes to more things that are in your zone of genius. If you will do that, I can promise you an exhilarating feeling inside and a sense of contribution that you may have not experienced for long periods of time before. So that's the product of living in your genius zone is you get to feel a certain kind of exhilaration inside yourself and a sense of satisfaction that I don't find as easy to get anywhere else in life other than through contacting and expressing your genius. Gay, had I had you in my life decades ago, there is no telling the phenomenal success I could have created and also how quickly I could have moved into my genius zone. Uh, I want to end on this thought. You talk a lot about creativity in your book. And in fact, some chapter is actually spent to sort of learning how to woo. You call it W-O-O, -O, how to woo yeah. your creativity. I've met many people that just simply say sort of um, pragmatically, I'm not creative. Well, I think everybody has some level of creativity. I don't agree with that. 
and I try to evangelize that a lot of people. Uh, send us off with some tips on how do we woo our creativity on our way from our zone of excellence to our zone of genius. Thank you for asking that question. That's at the heart and soul of, of everything I want to get across. So commitment has tremendous power to it. So I invite you and everyone who is listening and watching this to make a commitment to bringing forth more and more and more of your genius every day of life, every day of your life. Because if you can make that commitment, that sincere heartfelt commitment to bringing forth more and more and more of your genius, what that does is it trains a part of your mind to look for situations which bring forth your genius. So you need to commit to your genius first in order to bring it forth. That's an odd sort of way to look at it, but it actually is very natural because if you think of uh, the food you ate yesterday or today, the farmer that grew it, they didn't go out into their garden or their farm and say, okay, vegetables, give me some produce and then maybe I'll water you if I like what I see. No, the farmer goes out there and nurtures the seeds and puts energy into that. And that brings forth the produce. And so it's very natural in life to begin and make a commitment to something that you really don't know how to do. And so one of the most important things that you can do is open up your heart and your mind and get those unified around a commitment to bringing forth more and more and more of your genius every day. Gay, what are you writing right now? What's next? Right now I'm editing a couple of my mystery novels. I usually take a break from writing books like The Genius Zone and I switch over into writing a, uh, a mystery novel. Then I switch back to uh, another uh, psychology or spirituality or business book. So I'm, I'm writing, actually I've, I've created two mystery series. One involves a Tibetan Buddhist private detective in Los Angeles named Tenzing Norbu. And uh, the other is a Victorian era aristocrat, kind of a crosstown competitor to Sherlock Holmes. And his name is Sir Errol Hyde. So I'm working on polishing up both a Tenzing uh, mystery and a Sir Errol Hyde mystery right now. You're writing them congruently, two separate. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's remarkable. Gay Hendricks, thank you for joining us. Author, coach, mystery writer, best-selling author of 50 books with dozens more to come. Minimally, your philanthropy, uh, Gay, is, uh, is inspiring. Say hello to your wife. Happy anniversary to both of you. Thank you for joining us. And perhaps we'll have you back on, on leadership for one of your future books. We appreciate your contribution and your positivity and the, the contagiousness with which today you helped all of us think about how many of us are in our zone of incompetence or competence or perhaps all of us in our zone of excellence and how can we perhaps disrupt ourselves to move over into our zone of genius. Gay, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you very much. And thank you as well. If you're not subscribing to On Leadership, visit franklincovey.com. You can subscribe to our weekly newsletter that comes out every Tuesday. You also can consume our podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms. Give us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new episode of On Leadership.